imagine walking through a dense forest like this. The trees are towering above you. The branches are filtering out the sunlight. The ground is soft beneath your feet, and the ground is filled with uh, green sprouting plants. You can hear the sound of birds and the rustling of the leaves. You feel present and calm. But if you look a little bit closer, what you see is immense complexity. Every tree is unique. Their branches grow in unpredictable ways. Leaves has microscopic structures. And the moss carpets the ground in intricate patterns. Underneath all of this, mycelium grows through the soil. So nature is not just beautiful, it's structure and complexity at every scale. So why is it that we feel home in complexity? Why is it that nature's complexity feels harmonious and intriguing, while oftentimes human-made complexity feels chaotic and overwhelming? Could it be that nature's way of growing things, intertwining things, speaks more to us than our way of constructing things. Growing up, I was always interested in biology. The natural world, animals, plants, and fungi. This was just an immense catalog of inspiring creations for me. In, on the other hand, I, was, I loved drawing things, creating things, and solving complex problems. So going into my professional life, I became a design engineer, like two of my passions. At some point, I discovered biomimicry, looking at nature for design and engineering inspiration. And for me, that was just the, the source where everything met. So going back to nature, this time through the lenses of a design engineer, you start to see patterns and structures, logics, oftentimes reoccurring different places in nature, seemingly unrelated. It seems there's some kind of evolutionary advantage of doing things in a specific way. Zooming into a leaf, for example. This is not just a beautiful structure. This is a highly optimized system for material use, energy distribution, Strength, it's an adaptable system. It can grow while maintaining its function. So as a designer, looking at something that is aesthetically pleasing to us as biological humans, while also being effective and efficient, seemed like a, a no-brainer. <laughs> so this became the basis of my studio. We take nature solutions and through technological advances, push them into design. We look at patterns and structures and logics in nature, tested over millennia, and we implement them into functional, aesthetical, and sustainable solutions. We use a system we call seed to system or digital DNA. So if we find an organism in nature that we find interesting, we try to dissect it, try to figure out if there's patterns or mathematical structures in it, and then we try to recreate that in the computer, allowing us to grow a digital version of the biological. So let's, for example, take fire coral. Fire coral is an organism that starts from a single point and very efficiently grows out into a 3D space. It's constantly avoiding self-collision and is always trying to make sure that water can sift through it. So if we take this digital version here, we get something that in the digital realm almost looks like the biological version. It follows the same, same rules and it grows out in a uh, organic way. This is a super efficient system to connect a lot of different points 
This could be for energy distribution, fluid distribution. But anywhere where you need a, a complex network to function in an uh, efficient way. When we have that seed, we can now give that seed a task. We can say, reach all of these points on this surface while getting the shortest amount of distance from each point back to the starting point. And suddenly we have a tool that we can apply to a problem. Another example is the brain coral. It grows in a bit different way. It's constantly expanding while folding inwards to make a complex or compact shape with the uh, large surface area. And again, we have a digital version here where the shape tries to expand. And while it's expanding, it's constantly checking. You can see the pink areas. So the pink areas are where it's trying to see if it can grow out. And if it can't grow out, it will rely on its neighbors to do the expansion. And as an organism in the whole, it will do that in any specific surface. This is nice. This could be useful for air filtration or heat exchanging or everything where you need a compact yet a large surface. We use this an example here where we needed a heat exchanger. Normally a heat exchanger is a complex part, many different materials, complex assembly, but we needed a disposable one. So we wanted to make one in one material, one part, uh, and use as little material as possible. So we planted the seed on the inside and made it fill out the void in the most efficient way, using least amount of material while maximizing the surface area between the two liquids. The outside is also from nature. So we needed a pressure vessel. And in nature, we found this little thing. And this is a butterfly egg. And the butterfly egg holds the liquid inside. It's super thin, but because of the ridges, it's a little bit flexible. That makes it very, very strong and resistant to rupture. So we use that strategy on the outside. A different project we did was the genome chair. So this experiment was trying to build an object out of natural logics and constraints attached to those natural logics. If nature does things structurally, it will do bones. And it will do two different strategies, one being the overall shape of the bones, the other one being the internal structure. So, the overall shape of the bone is an evolutionary game. If a bird is too heavy, it won't survive. If it's too fragile, it won't survive. At the end, you end up with a highly optimized structure. In the digital realm, we can accelerate this process. Every generation lasts seconds. And we end up with a shape that is highly formed by the, uh, the, the loads that apply to it. On the inside here, we use the structure to fill out, eat all the material that we were forced to have in any other way, leaving us back with this grid structure that you have inside bones. So we use that uh, structure as the second part. And what we end up with is this. So we start out with a, with a shape, and the first evolutionary algorithm will remove the material. So we end up with an optimized structure. Because this is a functional object, we need a backrest and a seat. And these areas are way too big for the strength. So here the algorithm will start to remove as much material as possible while maintaining strength. So 
constantly making this uh, inside cellular structure that we see in birds' bones, for example. What we end up with is a highly specific product. <laughs> this is designed directly from nature's logics, only based on the outside perimeters. It's an adaptive thing. It's shaped specifically to what it's supposed to be. A thing nature does all the time, but it's not very used in our construction. A different experiment we did was what we call the chyma seed. So nature has this fantastic ability of making different structural functions from a single material. And for sustainability, making things in one material is essential. So looking at plant cells, for example, we look specifically at what's called calinchyma cells, and they're the backbone of plants. They have this ability of going gradually from rigid to flexible by adding more material to their cell walls where they have to be strong and removing where not. So here we have the adaptation. So this one, we have the red and orange areas where we want the, the structure to be soft and the blue area is where we want it to be rigid. And over time, that it will adapt based on the inputs that we give to it. Ending up with a product that is one material, uh, one piece, yet adaptive enough. It's rigid enough for you to sit on it. It's soft enough to feel comfortable all made from one cellular structure, repeating but adapting. So if we zoom into a thing like this, we start to look at something that might look something like underneath a microscope. <clears throat> We're starting to move away from what looks technical and computational and go into what looks biological. And for me, this is the whole essence of this, is trying to merge these two worlds, trying to see what we can take from the technological world and mix it with the biological one. And with that, we return to the forest again. I believe that if we want to feel more at home in our world, we need to look at nature for inspiration not just for aesthetical purposes, but for how we design, produce, and interact with our surroundings. In a time of resource scarcity, waste and recycling problems, we need to do things differently. And nature has over billions of years made efficient, sustainable systems. Everything is made from renewable material. So I think if we truly understand these systems combined with our technological advances, we can move away from competing against nature to designing as a continuation of nature. Thank you. <laughs>